You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Well, thanks again for coming, and welcome to the second half. Um, the story so far. Um, <laughs> Roxy Music have had some success and are about to embark on the uh, sunlit uplands of the early 70s. And uh, can we just show our pre- appreciation once again for the great Phil Manzanero? <laughs> So, Phil, we're, looking at, we're now looking at a picture of Roxy Music around the time of the, of the early success. And uh, it, 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 was, it seemed to be very rapid. How has life changed? It must have been changed very dramatically by that. Well, suddenly being in the charts and suddenly uh, selling um, a lot of records. We described ourselves <clears throat> initially as inspired amateurs, right? Because we hadn't done hundreds and hundreds of gigs. And so there was a little bit of resentment from other musicians that we hadn't paid our dues. Um, So we then embarked in that first year. In fact, I counted it up the other day. um, We actually did 100 gigs, um, which for Roxy is a lot. I probably (laughs) know. But all over, um, I looked at the dates from when I first played at the Hand and Flowers pub in Hammersmith. to uh, New Year's Eve in Chicago, in America, uh, in that year, 1972. We'd, yeah, I added it up. It's like 110 gigs or something. So <clears throat> we were determined to get better and, 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 and to actually um, become more professional, I suppose. You know, there's, there's a thing about your stagecraft, you know, learning how to actually put across the music. Uh, technically, you know, things were dodgy. You know, you, you didn't have your own PA most of the time. You didn't have uh, the incredible equipment that you can have now. There's a fascinating section where you go fairly early on to America and uh, there's a lot of anticipation about rock music. People read about them in the, in the British press and you support, yeah. I think it's Jethro Tull, yeah. And it, 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 very hard to win the audience over, wasn't it? <clears throat> well, uh, you know, in, in fact, um, the very first gig in America... Um, oh, no, actually, maybe it was just the second one, but it was at Madison Square Garden, supporting Jethro Tull. And, you know, if you've been playing at the Friars in a- Aylesbury <laughs> and then you suddenly find yourself on stage at Madison Square Gardens in this enormous cavernous room with... And you've still got the, the equivalent of this kind of amp. Um, and you don't know what's happening. And apparently, I, I've, I've read subsequently that, you know, the first six rows were just full of journos who'd come to see Roxy, not to see Jethro Tull. And consequently, when we came off stage, they all left. <laughs> there was this big gap in the front. <clears throat> but it was like some bad dream because, uh, you know, we're in this huge cavernous place and... We weren't used to playing those big venues. And, of course, they came on, and they were fabulous. You know, the lighting was incredible. This PA suddenly was brilliant. And so uh, we realised we had a lot to learn, you know. Did you think of yourselves as a democracy in the early days? Yeah, I think you, you, there, was, there was no clear leader of the group, was there? I mean, that, that evolved a bit later. But in, in, the, in the, the original lineup, there was, uh, you know, everybody had some kind of presence at the front of the... Of the stage, as it were. Well, you know, at the very beginning, uh, there was this sort of uh, strange situation where you had Brian Ferry over to the right playing piano and sort of facing oh, right. of course, yes. uh, um, the curtain, basically, and not facing the audience. And then Eno to the left. And, and that left me and Andy in the middle, sort of instrumentalists, yeah. thinking, well, what do we do? So, you know, we did sort of crazy antics and things but the management soon said look there's never been a band who doesn't have a lead singer in the middle to project and to be successful um so you know then brian was persuaded eventually you know to come into the middle brian ferry and and then we eventually got a keyboard player and stuff like that so that was all part of the learning process but you know, one of the important, you know, when I'm trying to make sense of what that was all about and what Roxy was all about, um, I don't even know if I put it in the book, but <clears throat> now I'm 
but, you know, what I thought, you know, I bought into the whole idea of the Beatles being, you know, like four brothers, or four, the three, four musketeers, and they all appeared to live in the same house. Yes. You know, if you saw... <laughs> they you know, did! The, the, they did! The film Help, you know, and... Tell me uh, they didn't. Uh, they uh, did! It's like Santa Claus, you know, doesn't... Oh, no. Um, so, you know, I always wanted to be in a band that I thought was like the four, five, six musketeers, an awful one and one for all. <clears throat> what I realise now that Roxy was never that. It was more like an art collective. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realise at the time. And really, uh, almost immediately, everyone started doing other things as well as Roxy. So Brian, s straight off the bat, started doing solo albums of covers. Uh, and then Eno left and he was, I was working with him on something different. Then Andy did a solo album. And, and then eventually, you know, I put my hand up and said, can I do a solo album? And they said, oh, yeah, okay, you know. So, uh, so we all, but that really set the pattern of everybody. Um, I mean, if you had, when I think about it now, you know, if you had a bunch of painters and things, they wouldn't all get together and all do a painting together, you know, say, well, I want black here, and then, no, it's pink or, or whatever. You know, and it's the same with writers. And, and so, the whole idea of bands, which started really at the beginning of the 60s, and uh, we all got swept up. You know, most of the people who now do interviews, older uh, rock and roll musicians, say that it was the Beatles and the Stones and then the Kinks and all that. Who, and you bought into this idea of being like the sort of musketeers. But in reality, what happens is that all the normal things that happen with with uh, relationships come into play and, and people want their ideas to be put forward first or they, they don't want to share or, you know. And I uh, found that um, weird sort of thing. You know, I'd been very much a person who was brought up on sort of hippie <laughs> traditions of, like, sharing everything and all that. And, and it, you... you I was thrust into a sort of more cutthroat world of pop music and also not helped by a management company who w would see the way, the best way for is to divide and rule. You know, so that um, ultimately led to great periods of us not working together, you know, and pursuing... Uh, our own solo projects but miraculously we seem to sort of get back together again <laughs> well here yeah, the, yeah yeah the the interesting thing is that you know that, that we're talking about that business of being a group the group were not on the cover of the records and they, the records were v very strong visual images but not featuring the group generally did that cause any resentment no, not really. I mean, I was very comfortable um, with leaving the art direction to uh, the professionals, really, which was, you know, people who'd studied art and image and uh, uh, generally knew the best photographers. And there was a team of people. So we're talking about Brian Ferry, led by Brian, uh, Nick DeVille, who, you know, became um, a professor at Goldsmiths and taught the YBAs and things like that. Um, Anthony Price and uh, the t a top model from the day and a, um amazing photographer, you know, who were the new generation of people coming up to sort of be the new leaders in all those areas. Um, would you only get to know about it when somebody said, there's the cover of the next? Uh, um, genuinely, yeah. Uh, um, what did you think when you saw Country Life? So, <laughs> so, co country thought, Life, you were thought, worried your mother was going to... I thought, Christ, what's my mother going to say? <laughs> so I went to this um, little muse house that the manager, David Enthoven, had near the Kensington or somewhere. And um, the cover came out. I said, well, this is the cover. <laughs> I, 
And the first thing, you know, the bottom of my head, you know, my, my mum, what's my mum going to say? You know, Catholic <laughs> little lady from, from Barranquilla. Um, uh, and it did cause a sensation everywhere. And, uh, you know, there's so many different versions of that cover yes. in a paper bag without yeah. the girls Some on the Some countries wouldn't have uh, di- di- different versions, didn't they? That's right. Um, but, you know, I thought it was a very witty play on, on the actual Country Life magazine thing. But, uh, you know, it had all sorts of <laughs> overtones. But, you know, th- th- it was... I think what happened, Brian went on a holiday somewhere in Portugal and, and Anthony Price was there as well. And next door were staying these two ladies and one was the girlfriend of the guitarist in Cannes and the other was the wife, uh, or, or not the wife, the uh, sister or something. And who knows what happened, but this is what happened. <laughs> the picture evolved. So, yeah, I mean, in, in general, you know, I trusted... Right. them uh, with that, that you know you can't do everything and I had no uh, you know I knew what I liked and you know I had my own uh, people who did my solo album artwork and stuff like that and we had uh, you know Diamond Head and we had a famous uh, guy Philip Castle do Listen Now and then famous photographer, Tony McGee, did K-Scope. So, you know, I had uh, my own different right. kind of thing. Right. So, so rocks and music kind of, uh, they go, it, people go off into solo projects in the 70s, but then come back together again. Yes. In the late 70s. Was that ever in question as to whether, whether they would or not? You would? Um, there's no plan. Uh, one of the uh, things I always say about Roxy is that we should have been more famous or richer or whatever, but it was a hopeless bunch of business people. Just at the point when we were going to be absolutely staggeringly huge, we imploded and yes. did something stupid. You know, so you could, if you map out the history of, of Roxy, um, right from 72 till last year, <laughs> it's a succession of, of, of bungling sort of... <laughs> Uh, inept businessmen, you know, who should have been a lot smarter, but basically just wanted to make music get on with their own thing. And, and uh, But on route, we produced some, some great tunes, you know. So uh, overall, you know, when I'm trying to make sense of it, I'm very happy and very proud of them all. Right. And they're all still doing stuff today, you know. Um, and we're still in different combinations working together still. I like the section very much uh, when you got back together again in 2001. And uh, firstly, you're offered a large amount of money, weren't you? Suddenly, I can't remember, it was now £7 million for 70 gigs or something, which was a yes. lot of money at the time. But the other was that Brian just spontaneously announces that he's found a load of dancers, was it, that he wants to bring on the tour? <laughs> What, just yeah, yeah, 16 night, dancers or something. The, 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 so what the, happened? The, the, the night before, that's right. He sort the of rang and said, oh, I've been to Quaglino's. And there's amazing dancers there. Be. And, um, you know, we go... Uh, 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 so, yeah, the first gig up in Glasgow has 16 dancers. <laughs> I think by the time we got to London, there were four. <laughs> <laughs> but... You That's know. exactly what you want Brian Ferry to be doing, don't you think? Yeah. Going to Coglino's, yeah. just saying to 16 girls, come on our tour. Yeah, it's terrific. Of course, it didn't phase me at all. Remember, I'd been brought up at the Tropicana Club in yeah. Havana with, yeah. with those kind of dancers. So I thought, bring them on. Yeah, bring it on. So is there, is there, when you get to this kind of stage, you know, looking at a picture of you being invested into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or whatever it is... Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, a, is now a pattern, isn't it, for all kinds of groups, that there's, a, there's an early period of stellar success and, and, and nobody gets as much money as they think they ought to get, whatever, and then you reunite later on. Is there a conversation there where you go, now, this time, we're not going to do it the same way? The shares are going to be this. Uh, I wish I could say there was a conversation. <laughs> But um, it's pretty much uh, hopeless sort of situation still, yeah. Well, so bands don't talk, do they? Is that, is that, it all seems to me to be the case. 
Yeah, well, guys don't talk, do they? I mean, <laughs> in, in, you know, in general. I mean, I, I, I suspect that most of the members of Roxy, when they read this book, will be amazed. They had no idea of my background, really. You know, even though you spend so much time together, you're talking about music or the gigs or or traveling, and then you go home and you don't you want to see each other for ages. And you see oh, your, your background? You mean your family or the places you lived? Or yeah. So, so they really didn't know about... Any, the, well, maybe su just superficially. I said, yeah. oh, well, I lived in, you know, a few countries in South America. And I didn't go into detail about it because probably they weren't interested. <laughs> That is, that is very male, isn't it? That is really, really, yeah. It's really interesting. So there'll be journalists who know more about Roxy Music than the mem members of Roxy Music know about Roxy Music. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I said to Brian that, you know, before Christmas, oh, I've got this memoir coming out. Don't worry, I'm not settling any scores. Or anything like but quite frankly, you know, you should write a memoir because I'd love to know what you were thinking. Because uh, I was about, only with you. Yeah, yeah, uh, at the time. And the same with Andy. And, you know, I'd love to, to know their perspective on the thing. It would be you know, genuinely fascinating for me. But, you know, let's hope. You know. So, um, that's Roxy Music. But at the same time, as you've referred to throughout, you... And you, you talk about this in the book, you know, the, 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 the value of and the joy of just working with a wide range of musicians. Yeah. Uh, give us an idea. Well, what, what, I mean, people think, associate you with Roxy music. I'm sure the people in this room know there's a lot more to you than that. But what's the kind of things that you'd like people to know more about of the range of what you do or have done? Well, um, the fact that I speak Spanish grew up uh, with a Latin sort of background means that I could actually understand what Spanish uh, rock bands and Spanish musicians were singing about. <clears throat> so by default, I became the sort of number one producer in the 90s of rock, what they call rock in Espanol. <clears throat> now, nobody's probably heard of, of the Spanish bands, but for instance, there's a band called Heroes del Silencio. They're huge. Um, they only did like three or four albums, but the singer uh, is still going strong. Uh, he was 20 in, in, in 1990 when I first did the album. Um, he'll be playing uh, in a few weeks' time at Madison Square Gardens. Uh, he played Mexico City to 80,000 people. He's just played all over South America to 60, 70,000 people. He's like the David Bowie of Spain. He's incredible. Musician, no one's ever heard of him. I bet, hands up, anyone who's heard of Enrique Bumbury. No. One hand has gone up, well, obviously for the you. record. Hello, Claire, Enrique. Claire, you Welcome. My wife. <laughs> oh, and Lucas. Him, actually. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, and Fito Pais, for instance, Argentinian, one of the most legends. They're all Grammy winners, not just Latin Grammy, Grammy winners in America. They're, they're huge, absolutely huge. Um, I did one of his, I produced one of his classic albums. I produced two of Hedo Estel Silencio albums. I produced this guy called Draco Rosa from Puerto Rico, who is like, uh, his music is like Jane's Addiction, but the, the voice on top and the dance is absolutely incredible. Uh, very, very famous in South America, Mexico, and America. Uh, because there's a lot of Spanish-speaking people in America. So most people don't know anything about that side. But the, you know, the reason I, I wanted to be a musician um, was, I guess, be, you know, this is the sort of thing that you learn from writing this kind of stuff, is that I, want, I wanted to be sociable. I wanted to meet with other people. Uh, to a certain extent, I was like a single child being taken around the world. My brother and sister were at school in England. I felt, you know, when I came to England, to South London, and I was in a boarding school, there was like a whole bunch of like people who say the same age, you know, having a laugh and stuff like that. So being in a band a bit was an extension of that. <clears throat> and then, but I wanted to be free. I wanted to be free to pursue musical conversations with all sorts of different people, 
So consequently, obviously, I gravitated towards Spanish-speaking people and amazing musicians from Cuba, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, etc. But also people from uh, Japan, from South Africa, and you, it's you know, music brings people together in a wonderful way, and and that really um, has been a great um, extra part of my musical career, really. Right, so th so those are people you've consciously worked with. I wanted to talk about some people you've unconsciously worked with. Ah. We, Look, it's Kanye is, West and Jay Z here. And so very tell, tell us that story because it's a corker. Okay, so um, I can't remember even what year it was. Was it 2005? Could it be? I'm I'm in. Um, I've got a studio in West London, and I'm driving down um, Westbourne Grove with my son Charlie. I think he's here tonight. Um, he can vouch for this. <clears throat> and, we, and the phone goes, mobile phone. I, said, oh. I, I sort of pull over. I think I pulled over. Uh, <laughs> on, on, honest girl. Um, and it was this person from New York saying, oh, hi, it's uh, blah, blah, blah from Rockefeller Records here. Just want to tell you that uh, uh, Jay-Z and Kenny West have sampled your guitar and it's on a track and the album is coming out next week. And uh, so... I, th I said it's coming out next week. It's coming it? out next Not week. Not kind of. Do no, you mind, no, or would you, do you mind permission? Or it's coming, it's out? coming out next week. Uh, so uh, we can't send it to you because it's top secret. So we play it down the phone. So I put it on speakerphone. And I said to Charlie, "Record it on your phone, <laughs> and then we'll 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 take it back to the studio. We'll do some crazy remix, send it back to them, just say ha ha, you know, whatever, you know, typical <laughs> sort of thing. But, it, but basically, it's sort of like." You know, ended the call and thought, well, it was great, that's fine. And then I suddenly thought, well, hang on, can they do that? Because um, I wrote it and, and also, uh, you know, it's on record of mine and I, I wrote it. So there's a publisher involved as well. So I rang back. I said, well, hang on a second, can I? Can I? Well, no, I rang uh, Virgin. I said, can I speak to the Business and Affairs and say, um, do you know about this? Um, are they allowed to do it? He said, uh, yeah. No, we've been negotiating this for, for months. Uh, uh, you'll be very pleased, Phil. I said, really? I said, yeah, because you're going to get a third of the track and uh, of the royalties. And, uh, in fact, you're going to get more than Jay-Z and Kanye West because there's so many people involved in this. But you're getting a third, third. So I thought, oh, oh, that's great. So, uh, so then I, um, I rang up the publisher. I said, do you know anything about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, you really no, Yeah, no, you'll be very pleased, you know. You're, 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 <laughs> and I'm getting a quarter. <laughs> but no, to start with, I, w w on the phone to New York, I said to the guy, look, I think you made a mistake because people always get my name mixed up with the keyboard player in the doors. Oh... <laughs> He's called Ray Manzarek. Absolutely. So, Fair point. You know, you know, I'll be touring in American people. Say, oh, Ray Manzarek. No, no. It's a Phil Manzanera. Um, who? Uh, and, and, and so they said, no, no, it's you. But then they played it down the phone, and I sort of recognized it. But it, it was sort of slowed down. So and this is, a, this is a, a track of one of your solo albums from 1979 or something? I think it's 1975 to 1976. It's called K-Scope, and that's the name of the, 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 the album. And it's an instrumental, you know. Instrumentals, uh, you know, to a certain extent, they're fillers to a certain extent on albums because you, you try and write a whole bunch of songs. And then you say, well, let's do some instrumentals. And I needed an instrumental, and it was the night before going into the, the studio. It, it actually was Chris Squire's studio in the basement of his house. And I was watching the telly, and I just went bling, blong, bleggy, blong. You're blong. watching the telly? Yeah, I'm watching the telly, and I'm uh, a whole lifetime just watching the telly. a few seconds' playing. work, basically. A few seconds' work. you make I a said, point about the financial impact yes, of this. Yes, that'll the do. So I go into the <laughs> studio the next day, and there's incredible drummer, Simon Phillips, and uh, Francis Monkman, who are from the 801 Live Band, and Bill McCormick, and everything. And we play this instrumental, and then it gets recorded... 
no one ever hears it, obviously, because it's sold nothing, probably. Um, and then forget about it. So and 30, then, 40 years go by. 40 years go by, and suddenly God says, take that, you know, for your troubles. Um, out of nowhere, this happens. And um, it just snowballs, because it comes out... And but first of all, let me say that the genius of this guy who sampled it, his name's 88 Keys, and he's a friend of Kanye West, and he specializes in sampling only vinyl records that are recorded on analog between 1975 and 1979. <laughs> I love it. And he combs all the record stores in Brooklyn and places like that, and he, he samples bits and pieces from stuff. And Jay-Z Kanye West are, uh, as you do, hire five-star hotel suites to record their albums in. And they're holed up at this one in Soho in uh, New York. Um, and he rings 88 Keys and says, can you, have you got any beats for me? Because we've got one more track to do. And we need to do it. And, and, and 88 Keys said, no. And also, my wife's going to kill me because I'm late to get home and the kids are going to go to bed or something. And so Kenya says, oh, please come around and just play. He said, look, I haven't got anything at all. He said, oh, please come around. He said, okay, I'll come around. He goes, it's the, um, goes to the hotel and they said, okay, what do you got? So he plays, okay, I've got 10 things. He plays them 10 things. They, they hear my thing, they go, we want that one. How random, you know. I mean, he slowed it down to half the speed. It was brilliant. That guy's a genius. And, so, and they write a whole song on that. It's finished in two days. They get the guy called The Dream to, to do some rapping on it and stuff. And put the album to bed. And it becomes the single. It wins a Grammy. It's in a Great Gatsby film. It's in another film. It's in ads for the Super Bowl. It, and all this, it's like, you know, with a slot machine... The things are going round and jing, and suddenly but this is going. And I'm saying to Claire, "You're not going to believe this." <laughs> I just had an email <laughs> saying it's being used for a thingy ad. In, uh, so, I, and you, in the book, you contrast the, your earnings from that with your earnings from Roxy music. music. Tell us, tell us, tell, tell us how that balances. Well, up. I think I do put in the book that you know, on the first album, there's six people. You know, Eno, Graham Simpson, Randy Mackay, Brian Ferry, me, Paul Thompson. And we get 5% between, between you. the six of us. That was only rectified about two years ago. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's a whole other conversation about the record industry and yeah. uh, the new paradigm of the whole business and, and how it affects young musicians and things. But, you know, that's another... Another book, someone else to write, <laughs> not yeah. me. But didn't you say you made more from yes. that than your entire yeah. life working in Roxy Music? From that one piece of music written from in one tiny 10 bit seconds of... on a sofa, and yeah. they go, I want that one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That's how... It's an amazing story. Well, <laughs> that's what's great and terrible about the, the music. Is anything can happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so there's no job security. You, you know, you've got to be prepared to fail. Um, but nice things can happen as well. you just got to have karma. Stick around long enough. Stick around long enough. Have good <laughs> karma. We must ask you about this. another fantastic oh. moment in the book where you, you are asked to be the MD of the uh, Guitar Legends uh, concert. It was in Seville. I'm trying to remember where it was now. Yeah, yeah it, was a, um, it was an event, a pre-event for well, Expo, Expo 91, and they decided Seville... Guitars, we'll call it the Night of the Guitars. Obviously, we'll have uh, five nights on BBC Two and live in America, all live, and we will provide a budget, not me, uh, they will provide a budget to hire the best musicians uh, in every genre that related to guitars, mainly. And for some reason, I end up as the musical director. Uh, you know, I do say in the thing that I feel a bit like Forrest Gump. I seem to turn up all over the place. <laughs> you know, like last week, I was 
producer of a number one swing album with Rod Stewart and and Jules Holland. How did that happen? I have right. no idea. Anyway, um, I so who were the guitarists that you had to marshal into into shape? Well, you, you, every famous guitarist who wasn't on tour, you know, from. Well, I'd have to look at the list. There's so many famous: Les Paul. Uh, Roger McGuinn, B.B. King, Bo Diddley, Robert Cray, um, uh, Brian May, uh, Steve, Steve Cropper. Oh, oh, Steve yeah, Cropper. Yeah, you name oh, him. Them. You, you name him, <laughs> they were there. Um, and then I had to come up with a concept for, for every night. So it's easy to start with the blues night, a soul night, uh. a folk night, a rock night. Ah. Uh, uh, okay, the night where anyone is left over would be my, my night. I'll be the musical director as well for my night. And, you know, they needed to have some big names. So they had big names. Joe Cocker, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Um, so this is the most fascinating yeah, bit of this chapter. Tell like? us about managing, trying to get persuade Bob Dylan to do something that, that he probably doesn't want to do. So they said, okay... Yeah, we were paying him a fortune. I said, right, uh, you've got Bob Dylan, you've got all these people, you're going to have to rehearse Bob Dylan. And we want him to play... Uh, what? We want him to play all along Watchtower, but not his version. <laughs> oh, easy. No, that'll be extra. <laughs> we want him to play the Jimi Hendrix version. <laughs> so I'm... It's 80 degrees outside... The rehearsal room is underneath the stage, outdoor stage in Seville, beautiful place, uh, built specially for this, marble everywhere. Um, and we have a rehearsal room. I have the most incredible band of music, the Miami Horns. I have Jack Bruce on bass. I have <laughs> the, the Billy Nichols and Cleveland Watkins, people who sing with The Who even now. Uh, backing vocals, I've got... Simon Phillips on drum, Pino Palladino on bay, oh, not on bay, no, on that one, Jack on that one. Um, so we wait. You know, I go to here, along here, I go to HMV. I said, right, I'm going to get all his records. <laughs> Obviously, I know them, but I'm going to get... quite a lot of them. Every, there's a lot of... Well, this is 1991. Um, there's still a lot of records, so that I'm covered. Anything he wants to play, we've got it, you know. So I'm thinking, you know, but he's got to play this other number. Um, so he comes in and with his manager, who's still his manager now, he was very young then, and he's wearing a parka. And because it is chilly underneath, because it's air conditioned, so fine, he's looking after his voice, but he's got a green parka and stuff. And um, he says, uh, Phil, this is Bob. And I'm thinking, yeah, I know who this is. You know, you don't... Uh, Bob, this is Phil. Okay, um, so, right. Uh, what are we going to play? So, I th I'm sitting there thinking... So, he suddenly says, um, do you know this Tex-Mex song <laughs> from 1947? <laughs> I said, well, we got all your... Stuff and uh, you know we can play it, any of your tunes, you know. <laughs> but this Tex Mex song from 1947. So I said no, but you, I tell you what, you play it and we'll learn it. From it. now on reflection, I'm be, I'm thinking now maybe he thought I was Mexican, <laughs> so maybe he was being nice. Maybe it's Spanish speaking. You know? Yeah, Spanish speaking Manzanera, a tall Brit looking guy, but you know. Um, uh, so I look at him and he plays it. I say, okay, right. I say, should you play it again? He plays it differently. Yes. <laughs> That's Bob. <laughs> and then he plays it differently again. <laughs> and then they're all, the music, Jack Bruce is going, you know, I've got to go and do something. The drummer says, I've got to phone my wife. And <laughs> they all leave and I'm just left with him. And he's looking at me and he says, you know, Phil, why don't we just play acoustics? Just two of it, you know. I'm thinking, oh, Christ, what, you know. I said, but the thing is, Bob, that we've got to, 
And I'm, the bubble in my head is saying, oh, you can't say this. He's Bob Dylan. He's right. We're going to play all along the show, but it's not your version. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, Arr. there's only three chords in all along the watch show. Let me just say. So they all come back in and we, start, we crank it all up. We start playing and he's by the microphone. And we go we do the intro. I'm playing the Hendrix part. I wish, you know, I'm playing the, the Hendrix part, and he doesn't sing. He comes up to the microphone, and we're all going. <laughs> this goes on. It's only three chords. It goes on and on. I said, "All right, okay, let's just stop." At which point, uh, it's a big room, and there's like different setups in the room. At which point, Keith Richards comes in. <laughs> oh, God. Just wait. To add to your problems. Trouble waters. <laughs> and it's his turn for rehearsals. Oh. So it's like, oh, your rehearsal time's over, mate. <laughs> and so they go over and start kicking the hell out of their thing and playing rock and roll. And the drummer stands up and points at Joe and says, you, come and sing. And he goes over and starts singing. You know, I think, oh. Very British of me, yeah. yeah. Just too polite, you know. <laughs> so I, I go off and you know, scratching my head. And I think, I know that he, I'm cunning, you know. I think, I know he likes Richard Thompson. So I ring Richard Thompson, <laughs> who's playing in Amsterdam. I say, Richard, would you like to play with Bob Dylan? You know, hey, who wouldn't, you know. He said, yeah, great, okay. We'll send you flights and everything. Just come. So he arrives... And then I say to him, <clears throat> having a bit of a problem sort of working out what the hell he's going to play. <clears throat> um, so I said, you go into his dressing room. Uh, we're now getting very close to the gig, like the night before and stuff. And it's live. And the manager has said to me, Bob might come on, he might not. <laughs> if he doesn't come on, who's going to sing? <laughs> Jack Bruce just explodes his head explodes at that point you know with the Glaswegian expletives and uh, you, you don't want to get on the wrong side of Jack rest in peace lovely guy <clears throat> so um, Richard goes in and I only found out like a couple of years ago when Richard came to my studio I said what did he say when you went in and he said do you know this Tex-Mex song from 1946 <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and Richard story. said, no. I said, you play it to me. Play it different every time. <laughs> so, so if you, you can watch on YouTube. If, if you, we're all like looking, is he going to come on? He said, but if he does come on, make sure you announce him. And obviously I said, Senor, senores, el Senor Bob Dylan. Because I could see a spotty shirt in the background. He comes out and you can see us all th thinking, what's he playing? Yeah. yeah. You know, we're all, you know, you could see people going, C, G, you know. And apparently it was Boots of Spanish Leather, but it was, you know how he does different versions. Yeah. Of, of, <laughs> so you the Tex-Mex version. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you can, you know, Mexican, yeah, 1947 version. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Very but good. But everybody has a Bob Dylan story. And uh, I spoke, Phil Ramone was the producer on, um, on that. And uh, I asked him, how do you... He, produced a, also a Dylan album. I said, how do you record, Bob? He said, you just stand there. He comes in and he does whatever he wants and he leaves and you just absolutely gather whatever you Pick can. Pick up the pieces. But the guy's, you know, fair enough, he's Bob Dylan. He's you, Bob Dylan. He's Bob Dylan. He can do what he likes. He's fantastic. <laughs> so we're, we're looking now at a picture of, uh, uh, of you um, uh, as a member of a kind of all-star group with... Robert Wyatt and David Bowie and uh, and um, have we got Dave Gilmore and uh, David Crosby and so forth. I mean, do you, do you ever reflect when you... I mean, this is some while ago, but um, do you ever reflect that you're very privileged to have this kind of third age of, uh, you know, a, a profession that you entered when you were 20, 21 or whatever, and, you, and you're still in it and you're, and you're still working with some of the same people? after all these years. <laughs> I, I'm the luckiest guy. You know, it's, it's what I wanted to do. You know, I used to say that when I joined Roxy, it was like Christmas every day. And it was. You know, it was just so exciting. It's what I always wanted to do. And um, 
just, you know, found that if I just sort of stay in my lane <laughs> and keep going and just try and be a good person, things will happen. And so I've ended up with these things sort of happening, incredibly lucky. I seem to be lucky. And I mean, that was the only time I ever played on stage beside David Bowie, and it's his last ever performance in the UK, when he came on and sang Arnold Lane and Comfortably Numb at the Albert Hall with David Gilmore and, and all those other. And, but to have, I haven't mentioned it before, but to have Robert White and David Gilmore there, two people who I met when I was 16. Yeah. Yes, they both helped you, didn't they, get started? And... They, 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 I mean, David uh, was a friend of my brother's, and when my mother was the nice Colombian lady who understood cumbia, didn't really understand rock and roll, and I said, I want to be a rock and roll musician. What, okay, what's that? You know, and my brother said, let's go and meet this guy I know who's just become a professional musician. Ask him what you have to do to become a professional musician. And we had lunch, and it turned out to be David Gilmore, and he'd just joined Pink Floyd. You know, that was in 1967, in January 1967. What was his advice? Can you remember? Well, he can't remember, but he said he must be bloody good, because five years later, <laughs> you, you join Roxy, and, and I think I should get a percentage. Why, why do you think... I've, final question, really. Mm. Why do, you, why do you think you, you, you get the call to do these things? Uh, do, do you ever reflect on what it is that your peers um, value about you? I'm, well, I'm not asking you to be flatter yourself or anything no. like that, but you must have some kind of view. Well, um, I don't know, but uh, Robert Wyatt's wife, Lady Angie, Angie, Alfie, Alfreda, Alfreda Brench. Uh, used to say uh, a few years ago, you seem to be like a facilitator. And I th I've thought about that. I thought maybe, that, maybe that's what it is. I, you know, I, I know a lot about music. And one of the, uh, I think I mentioned before, one of the great bits of advice that Ian MacDonald gave me was to think conceptually and think about context. Why are you doing what you're doing? What are we doing here? And that's the kind of question. And, and also, you know, when it comes to production and working with people, I think of George Martin. You know, I'd never touch the desk or anything. I think about the big picture, really. Right, okay. That's a good answer. Excellent yeah. answer. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Yeah.